Thank you for tuning in to the kickoff of our 2020 speaker series. In honor of the anniversary of women's suffrage, this year's series focuses on the exceptional women of Jefferson Patterson Park Museum. We have speakers discussing the accomplishments of Gertrude Sawyer, the architect of many of the buildings on the grounds, and talks with staff members discussing the work they've been doing in the fields of horticulture, conservation, and archaeology. Lectures will be held on the third Thursday of every month, May through October. Lectures will be held in the Mac Lab meeting room at JPPM at 7 p.m. when possible. If we're unable to meet in person, we'll continue offering digital lectures. Next month's lecture is entitled Built by Women and will be presented by Joanne Murray, Teresa Del Nino, Marlene Wally Shade. They will discuss the Built by Women exhibit. The Built by Women exhibit showcases up to 36 winning sites of a juried competition organized by the Beverly Willis Foundation to make visible the often invisible work of women in design and construction. It features sites in and around the D.C. area, including Maryland and Virginia, where women were directly responsible for leading the design and construction of the project. This exhibit will be on display in the Patterson House on our grounds when our facilities reopen. Tonight's presentation is our first ever digital lecture. Our speaker is Lindsay Hollister. Lindsay Hollister received her Bachelor of Science in Marine Studies in 2001. Since then, she's built her life around Chesapeake Bay conservation, restoration, and education. Her current position at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum's first horticulturist has been informed by a lifetime of curiosity about plants in the natural world. Lindsay has worked as a landscape contractor, a science technician at Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, stewardship contractor for Maryland Department of Natural Resources, volunteer coordinator at Jug Bay Wetlands Sanctuary, and a naturalist for Calvert County Natural Resource Division. Other professional development includes master watershed stewardship training, permaculture design certification, Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Certification, and Garden Outreach with multiple community groups. In her free time, she enjoys paddling the Patuxent with her husband, tending the home gardens with her cat, and backcountry camping and eating wild plants. Her talk tonight is titled Introduction to Beneficial Insects. So welcome to the weird and wonderful world of insects. Like them or not, life as we know it depends on the interactions they have with plants and other animals. So join us for an overview of the ways in which they enhance our lives and how you can make your yard more inviting to the many insect allies that reside in our area. So from there, I'll kick it to Lindsay. Thank you. Hello, welcome to a brief introduction to beneficial insects. Uh, yes, I am a horticulturalist, but any plant person worth their salt knows that there is an inextricable link between many of our plant friends and many of our insect friends. So I will be bringing up some plants this evening, uh, but it is mostly about the insects themselves. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of history tonight, uh, talk about some of the overarching qualities of some of our beneficial insects and mix it up with a couple um, specific species that I wanted to highlight tonight. And then we'll finish off with some tips for your home garden and how you can encourage a uh, beneficial insect community. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the history of insects. Uh, I want to start at the beginning, uh, when they first came onto our planet. So going way back, over 400 million years ago, you can look at our graphic on the bottom, and that's when we first started to get insect species on the planet. And then moving forward, you can see uh, dragonflies emerged in the Carboniferous about 350 million years ago, and other familiar insects, butterflies in the Triassic. And by the time we got to the Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago, uh, all of our recognizable insects were formed. So T-Rex would have had very similar looking insects harassing him uh, as we have today, uh, except that dragonfly would have had a six foot wingspan, which is just remarkable. By comparison, uh, humans, our species, is at most one half of a million years old or 500,000 years old. So we are a very young species, so I, it's important to me to keep that dose of humility uh, when we consider uh, some of the actions that we take towards uh, the insects that we share this planet with. All right, so welcome to our weird and wonderful world of insects. Uh, I just wanted to start with just some fun highlights of some of the uh, quirky individuals that call our part of the world home. So over on the top left, uh, we have the hickory horned devil, uh, which is our largest caterpillar. I've only met one of these once, uh, but it was spectacular. Uh, it will fill up your whole hand if you hold it. Um, 
in the top middle. Uh, this is one of my favorite signs of insects that I see commonly around here. Uh, they love sandy soil and it needs to be pretty bare soil for them to make their little pits here. This is the ant lion. It's a, a, a larval insect that lives down in there and grabs ants and eats them. Over on the top right, we don't have leaf cutter ants, but we do have leaf cutter bees. Uh, and I've noticed at my home gardens that they prefer the leaves of redbud trees and spice bushes to use to line their nests with. Uh, on the bottom left is one of my favorite predatory insects, the wheel bug. You can see that signature cog shape running across the top of its thorax, like some cool back mohawk. Uh, down on the bottom right is a beetle I just met as I was preparing for this talk. Uh, it's a type of ground beetle that hunts caterpillars. And this particular species was originally introduced to the United States in the early 1900s as a biological control for gypsy moths. Uh, since then, it's spread uh, throughout the Northeast United States and down into our area, but it's never really become a nuisance. Uh, there's very few sightings. So this was the first one I met and it was very brightly colored. Cool bug. All right, so we are scratching the surface of the surface tonight with this talk. Uh, so I just wanted to stress that point that if you look at this graphic, uh, most of the pie is red. Uh, that's because insects make up most of the species diversity on the planet. Over 75% of the known species are insects and that's being very conservative. Uh, if you look at the next largest chunk of the pie, mollusks, they only make up 10%. So if you add up all of the other species species together, they still don't even come close to the number of insects that are on the planet. So this really is their world and we're living in it. Uh, but of course, we know they make a nuisance of themselves. So I did want to address that uh, because not all benefit not all insects are beneficial, and uh, most of us have had personal experience with that. Uh, but I want to stress also that sometimes our cultural practices can invite them to make pests of themselves, or our cultural practices can invite a community of animals to live together and self-regulate each other. So that's the point that I'm trying to make tonight, uh, is that self-regulation instead of uh, human intervention. So you can see on the left, our beautiful immaculate turf lawn, uh, which is very attractive to look at, um, nice to walk on barefoot. Uh, but if you are an insect that loves eating turf grass or the roots of turf grass, um, this is a buffet for you. And the same is true on the far right uh, with our monoculture agriculture fields. When we put acres and acres of one plant uh, in a densely concentrated area um, that invites the buffet effect for whatever insect prefers to feed on that plant. And because there's not a proper habitat with that plant, there's no predators that can come in to control it. So it takes a lot of human input to maintain those systems. Uh, whereas if you look at that photo in the middle, the polyculture, uh, this is a very different form of farming that integrates a variety of different plant types so that you can have that self-regulation. And we'll touch on that a little bit more at the end of our talk, but that is a whole topic in and of itself. Okay, uh, I also want to mention, of course, mosquitoes can carry diseases, um, and it's certainly nothing to joke about. Um, if you are in Africa, malaria is a serious risk to your health. Uh, however, here in the United States, it's not very high on our list of risks, and uh, I couldn't help but put over on the right there our leading causes of death in the United States. And so I was curious and uh, mosquito-borne illnesses are not in the top 15. So just keeping things in perspective, um, when we consider having our neighborhood um, treated with pesticides aerially for mosquitoes, um, is that potential mosquito outbreak more or less harmful than destroying other beneficial insects? That's something that communities need to decide for themselves. 
All right, so um, bad news out of the way, let's talk about all of the good things that insects have to offer. Uh, so web of life, um, insects are really, in my opinion, in the heart of the web of life. All of the organisms that are familiar to us, either directly or indirectly, benefit from what insects are doing on our planet, their ecosystem services, if you will. So over on our left graphic, you can see some uh, detritus feeding insects. So when an animal animal dies, when a plant dies, it gets broken down, not just by insects, but they do play a big role in that. Um, so they're important for recycling things uh, out in the natural world. Uh, over on the right side, we have a little graphic of an aquatic food chain, and you can see there's kind of three tiers on there. And right in the middle, again, the heart of that food web is our insects. So they are both predators and prey in that aquatic food web. So very important to support those higher organisms like the fish that we like to eat. And the web of life would not be complete without waste. So here is our beautiful, humble dung beetle rolling his ball of poop backwards uh, so that his mate can lay her eggs on it. Um, so this is just a remarkable thing that one of our insects does for us, waste services. Thank you, dung beetle. Pollination. Uh, Life as we know it, us humans would not be the same uh, if insects did not pollinate flowering plants. Uh, so it cannot be overemphasized uh, how important pollination is to our lives. So this is another one of those ecosystem services that uh, insects are providing for us that is absolutely critical. Um, and because flowering plants and insects have both been evolving together for about 150 million years, some of these plants and insects have become very closely tied to each other, so closely that there are certain species of insects that cannot live without their plant and certain plant species that cannot live without their insect pollinators. The benefits of insects are also cultural. Uh, on the left, you can see this is a Day of the Dead parade uh, where people are dressed up like monarch butterflies. Uh, so this is one of our beautiful uh, cross-continental connections with Central America. We have all of these monarch butterflies that come up from the mountains of Mexico in the spring where they've overwintered. And they breed all throughout North America all summer long. And the great grandchildren of those butterflies that overwintered in Mexico return to those same fir forests to overwinter and continue the life cycle. Uh, so their arrival back in Mexico coincides with the Day of the Dead Festival. So they're often incorporated into the celebration. Mariposa. Over on the right uh, is some pupa on a stick. So in a lot of cultures, uh, insect protein is uh, a very reliable food source for a lot of people. So it's incorporated into the diet on a regular basis. Uh, other benefits of insects for us culturally, up on the top left, uh, silk is produced from the cocoons of an indescript little brown moth. Uh, below that, uh, for those who like red lipstick, uh, it is made from crushed up beetles, that color. Up on the top right, uh, we have the very charismatic honeybee on its hive. Uh, the beeswax and the honey uh, are two great products that I am a big fan of. Uh, but that colonial life cycle is uh, very uncommon in the world of insects, and we'll talk about that a little more. Below that is uh, the lac insect, who produces a little coating over itself to protect it while it's feeding on plants, uh, and that's what we get shellac from. All right, and the humble fruit fly. So human genetics and fruit fly genetics are surprisingly similar. We share about 60% of our genome with them and some of our genes are identical to fruit flies, believe it or not. Uh, so we are able to do a lot of genetic testing on them and learn about diseases on a much shorter time frame than we could studying it in humans because they have such short life cycles and you can produce 10 generations in a year. So they are invaluable to genetic researchers and epidemiological studies. Okay, so 
beautiful garden photo. Uh, we are shifting into garden mode. So now we're going to delve into some of the groups of insects to look for in the garden. We're not going to talk about uh, group identification per se, but we will be meeting some of those individuals as we go through our slides here. Uh, so I love this graphic. Um, this shows what, in my opinion, is a very healthy habitat to encourage beneficial insects. There's a lot of native plants in here. There's a lot of flowering things. There's a variety of flower structure, uh, variety of plants in general. So this is really great to support. Good way to start a beneficial insect community. Emulate this photo. Okay, so again, uh, pollinators. Uh, you can see here I've underlined more than two thirds of the world's crop species depend on pollinators. So when you look outside your door, most of the plants you see um, have pollinators associated with them. So our world would be very different without them. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of these insect orders. Uh, so learning the different orders of insects, their general body shape, is a good way to start if you're a beginning uh, entomologist, an amateur. Uh, so bees and wasps, uh, and also ants are in order Hymenoptera. Our social insects live in order Hymenoptera. Beetles, order Coleoptera, uh, very diverse group, also pollinators. Our butterflies and moths, the Lepidopterans. Flies are also a, another big group of pollinators. And we won't be talking about uh, non-insect pollinators tonight, but I don't want to leave out our vertebrate pollinators um, because some of them uh, are critically important to their specific plants that they pollinate. Okay, bees are the best. Uh, so bees are custom built to be efficient pollinators. Uh, they have hairy bodies, these beautiful little fuzzy parts, uh, hairs on their legs, hairs on their abdomens. They each have different adaptations for gathering pollen. Bees also have a straw-like mouth because they are there to drink the nectar out of the flowers. So that is what the flower offers to the pollinators to bring them in so that the pollinators move the pollen for them so that these plants can reproduce. Uh, some bees are generalists. That means they'll pollinate a variety of flowers. Some bees are specialists down to the point where they only have one specific species of plant that they pollinate. Uh, and there are a lot of imitators out there. There are wasp imitators of bees. There are fly imitators of bees. Uh, it's a very common practice for other insects to mimic a bee. So you definitely need to look closely. Uh, bees have four wings. Flies have two wings. Uh, so there's definitely a lot to learn here. Okay, befriending the bees. So in Maryland alone, we have about 400 species of bees. And you probably met some of these and not realized it because of their color or their size. Uh, but 70% of those bees uh, are making tunnels down in the soil. And they're some of our earliest pollinators to emerge in the spring. Uh, jumping to the far right, the other 30% of our native bees are laying their eggs in cavities. So the stems of some of our, our perennial plants are hollow or they have a very pithy, lightweight material in there that the bees can dig out to lay their eggs in. These make their own little chambers in there. So you can see three different types of these cavity nesting bees in that uh, graphic below. And then going back to bumblebees in the middle. Bumblebees are the best of the best. Uh, so whereas honeybees are widely recognized and widely used in agriculture, um, again, that's a European species that's been imported, so they're not naturally occurring in our landscape. But bumblebees are, uh, and they do have a similar life cycle to honeybees. They do live colonially, uh, but in much smaller groups. Uh, so they're not used the same way they are uh, in agriculture as the honeybees, but they can be used commercially, mostly in greenhouse settings is uh, more appropriate for their colony size. And they also have a unique ability uh, called buzz sonication that allows them to rattle out the pollen grains of certain plants like tomatoes uh, and squashes that are very reluctant to give up their pollen grains. Uh, so bumblebees are custom designed for getting a hold of those pollen grains. Um, 
And they also, because of their large size, they can fly uh, in colder temperatures than other pollinators. They can fly in windier weather than other pollinators. Uh, and they can even um, unhinge their wings from their muscles and bring up their own body temperature, uh, which is very uncommon feature in insects because they are cold blooded. The wonderful bumble BFFs. Okay, and I can't emphasize this enough either. Uh, because most of these bees are living alone, these are literally single mother bees, um, you have to be actively squishing it, um, either intentionally or accidentally, for them to sting you. Um, they are minding their own business, so if you do as well, you're not going to get stung. All right, beetles. Uh, of the insects, these are the most speciose group of insects. There's about 40,000 species of beetles on the planet, uh, and they are probably the prettiest. Um, butterflies are up there too, but uh, beetles are remarkable that way with their variations and colorations. Uh, so here's some of our local beetles. Uh, on the left, you can see some ladybugs. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, sizes, not so much, but definitely shapes. Uh, they are pretty similar in size to each other. Uh, in the middle there is one of my favorite predatory beetles, the six-spotted tiger beetle. These are common. They're uh, just emerging uh, at this time of year. Bright emerald green, and they're often seen down on the ground. They chase and hunt other insects for food. And then we've got some other uh, pollen-eating beetles over on the right there that you might see in your home garden. Goldenrod beetle, leatherwing, and cucumber beetles down on the bottom, which can be considered a pest. So these guys are pests, predators, and pollinators. All right, so our next group of insects that are both pollinators and pests uh, are the Lepidoptera, our butterflies and moths. Uh, so I have a little activity here that I'd like to walk us through. Uh, we have graphics of five different species of Lepidopteran caterpillars. And I'm just going to give you a second to look over these pictures. Maybe you recognize some of these caterpillars. Maybe you recognize the plants they're chewing on. Uh, I want to show you the adult form of these caterpillars, but I also want to stress that for a lot of our caterpillars, whether they be pest or beloved, uh, they have specific families of plants that they eat, or in some cases, specific species of plants. So they are often very closely tied to certain plants, again, because of that evolutionary link. They co-evolved with each other, so their fates are tied to each other. I've also included, uh, because they are closely related but not quite the same, we've got a moth cocoon on the left side there of one of our silkworms. So that's a sign of an insect to look for. And then over on the far right top is the chrysalis for a monarch butterfly. Beautiful uh, golden ring around uh, the upper third there, or the lower third, depending on how you look at it. Okay, so we've got our caterpillars. We're going to start on the top left here. Uh, these three are all the same, but as they molt out of their caterpillar skins into bigger bodies, they do change their color pattern a little bit. And these caterpillars are feeding on parsley. So some of you who love to grow your own herbs will probably recognize this one. And this is the black swallowtail. So that's what it looks like as an adult. Uh, beautiful butterflies. This is one of our larger species of butterflies that we have in this area. And moving across to the upper right photograph, we've got just a mess of caterpillars, black and yellow, feeding on a kale leaf. Or it could be a broccoli. Or it could be a Brussels sprout. Uh, some of you have probably encountered this as well if you like growing your own brassicas. This is the cabbage white. This is a European butterfly. These ones were not originally here until we started getting those European vegetables. All right, down on the bottom left, we have kind of a hairy caterpillar. It's got a lot of little fuzzy spines sticking out of it. And that one has some beautiful red dots down the back and beautiful blue dots up the front. And it's chewing on an oak leaf. This is the gypsy moth. 
uh, which has been a pest species since it first got loose uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, or might have even been the late 1800s. It was being considered as a silk producer, uh, but it didn't work out. And now it's been a running rampant as a pest through our forests ever since. Uh, the bottom middle, I call this the Slimer caterpillar, um, very kind of blobby shape. Uh, it's chewing on a sweet gum leaf in this photograph, but it can eat a variety of forest leaves. This is the Luna moth, one of my favorite moths. Uh, over on the far right, we have a lovely stripy caterpillar. Uh, feeding on a beautiful plant, the butterfly milkweed. And that will turn into the monarch. And I'm going to plug the Citizen Science Project. You can see that white round sticker on the wing of the monarch on the left there. That is a project that you can participate in right here in Calvert County every fall. Our area naturalists uh, capture with nets the migrating monarchs that are going down to Mexico. And we put those little stickers on their wings. And if someone recovers that monarch, uh, we know how far it traveled from where we put that sticker on. And in some cases, we can learn a little bit more about uh, how long it lived and other parts of monarch migration. So this is a way to help the scientists understand them better. Okay, uh, so caterpillars are, as I mentioned, both a pollinator and a pest. So they eat our veg, we don't like that. Some of them have stinging hairs. You can look at my middle graphic on the right, that's the saddleback caterpillar. Uh, if you touch that, um, it will feel like a bee sting. That's not fun, uh, but it is cool looking. Uh, and some of you might recognize down on the bottom there, the nests of the tent caterpillars and webworms. Um, this is a really clever adaptation. They make these protective webs around themselves and feed within that. Uh, so it makes it harder for predators to come and eat them because caterpillars are like the chicken of the insect world. Everybody loves it. It's delicious. We all want some. Um, and some people have a real problem with these nests. And uh, I've heard it's practice to cut these off the trees and burn them. Uh, I would ask you to discontinue that practice if it's one of your own um, and leave it for the birds. Uh, so just to help us keep the ecological perspective here, I have another activity I'd just like to walk us through. So uh, if you were a family of birds uh, and you had five young to feed, they just hatched out of their eggs and you need to get them out of the nest in 15 days, they're gonna grow their feathers and fly out because it's gonna get real crowded in that nest real fast. So if you had to feed those young, would you have to gather 50 caterpillars to feed them for 15 days, 500 caterpillars, or 5,000 caterpillars to get those babies out of the nest? So according to some research that some folks did up at the Cornell Lab in New York, uh, our friend the chickadee needs 7,500 caterpillars to get one brood of babies out of the nest. So that's just getting it out of the nest. That's not the rest of its life. Uh, so even though you might recognize a chickadee as a seed-eating bird, uh, just about every songbird that breeds in North America is feeding its young caterpillars. That's what they do. That's why they come here to our forests is to eat caterpillars. So the importance of caterpillars caterpillars to a lot of our birds also cannot be understated. So if you have a pest problem, consider the birds. They might help you out. Okay, the humble fly. We're back to the humble fly. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, scientists debate whether or not it was flies or beetles that are the original pollinators. Um, the fossil evidence kind of goes back and forth a little bit. 
but there is a 150 million year relationship between flies and plants. So some of our primitive plants have fly pollinators. Uh, and some of our other plants like the cacao where chocolate comes from. So our graphic on the bottom left there is the little eensy weensy cacao flowers. They're less than half an inch long. So they have a very tiny pollinator that corresponds with that. It's called a midge. It's a type of fly. Um, so if this one particular midge disappears from the face of the earth for whatever reason, um, there would be nothing to pollinate those flowers and those cacao beans would never form. So no chocolate. That's not a world I want to live in. Uh, over on the right, we have a lovely little bee mimic called a flower fly. Uh, I've got them circled in red on there or her. Uh, so this is a really cute little fly that is both pollinator as an adult and a predator as a larva. So it's out there eating your garden pests for you uh, when it's younger. Very cute little things. They're uh, usually less than half an inch long, but they're also very common. So if you look closely, you'll see them. Two wings, large eyes. Um, that's how you can tell them from a real bee. And daisy fleabane is one of my favorite wildflowers that I like to let grow on my wild edges. It's good for those flower flies. Okay, uh, here's some of my other favorite predatory insects. I have a lot of aphids that come into my gardens, but I know if I just wait patiently, my predators will come and take care of those aphids for me. Uh, so I have two insects here, the lacewing life cycle on the left and the ladybug life cycle on the right. Uh, both of these insects go through complete metamorphosis. So just like a butterfly emerges from a caterpillar, these insects also transform transform and look very different um, in their young form, their larval form versus their adult form. But the important point is that they are aphid predators their entire life. Uh, so if you know to recognize these cool little terrestrial colorful alligators, as I call them, uh, the larva, then you won't think that you have a pest on your plant. You'll know that you have an ally that's eating your aphids for you. And just another image of the lacewing that's uh, a complete image because they are quite lovely insects to look at. They're usually uh, between half an inch and an inch long, green and brown lacewings in our area. Okay, so we have, this is another super cool uh, pest controller that we have in this area. If you grow tomatoes or if you are a tobacco grower, you'll recognize the hornworm on the right. Uh, and it has a wasp that parasitizes it. Um, so you can see all those little white things sticking out of the caterpillar. Those are the cocoons of the wasp babies. And that is the life cycle that you're most likely to see because the wasp itself is so tiny. Um, so if you see that, you know that your hornworm is doomed and you can just leave it to the wasp to take care of it. Uh, on the left there, the yarrow flower, this is one of our beautiful wildflowers. Uh, and the uh, wasp likes to use that as a pollen source as an adult. So it's a nice uh, flower to have around if you're growing tobacco or tomatoes. Help your wasp predator. Parasite. Uh, we also have some generalist predators. So these are indiscriminate killers. So you can see the dragonfly on the right. I love dragonflies. I do feel bad for that butterfly. Um, but, you know, on the whole, dragonflies are great. They'll also eat mosquitoes for you. So I want to keep my dragonflies around. Um, jumping back to the left, the wheel bug, we met him in one of our earlier slides. Um, they have a mouth like a straw, but unlike the bee tongue that is soft like a bendy straw, um, this is a sharp pointed straw. So it can just stab right through um, that Japanese beetle's thorax in between the thorax and the abdomen there, and it sucks the life out of the beetle, just like the aphid is using its sharp straw mouth to suck the life out of your plants. Okay, uh, in the middle, uh, we have mantises, and there are different species of mantises. And uh, in my opinion, it's important to keep that in mind. Our native Carolina mantis down there on the left, uh, that one's always been here. So it is a naturally occurring part of our ecosystem. Uh, on the right there, we have a grizzly picture of a Chinese mantis hanging upside down from the hummingbird feeder. 
yes, with a dead hummingbird. So these mantises get up to six inches. They're enormous insects. Um, they're really cool to see, but I like hummingbirds and I'm not a huge fan of the fact that they can kill them. So um, just keep that in mind if you see them in your garden and you like hummingbirds. Uh, up above that is the egg case. So this is another sign of uh, insects to look for in your garden. On the left is the egg case of our native mantis, very flush with the twig. On the right is the egg case of the Chinese mantis. It's much more bulbous and sticks off the twig, but these are both relatively small and brown, um, so you do have to be looking closely to see them. All right, we have to talk about spiders. These are not an insect, uh, but just for a quick insect review, uh, insects have three body parts and six legs. Spiders have two body parts and eight legs. Uh, but because these guys are a good sign of a healthy habitat, I wanted to include two of the spiders you might see in your garden if uh, you have provided good habitat for beneficials in general. So we've got uh, one of my favorite spiders on the right here, the Argiope or garden spider. They get quite large. They have that striking pattern on their abdomen and they make this big silky zigzag in the middle of their web. So they're hard to miss in your garden. Um, and I've seen them catch grasshoppers in my garden, which I'm grateful for because grasshoppers have done a lot of chewing damage on some of my plants. Uh, the graphic in the lower there is a crab spider or a goldenrod spider. They can change from orange to white. So they are very good at camouflaging. It's hard to even find it on that photo. Uh, and they just wait on the edges of the flowers or within the flowers for a pollinator to come by. So they specialize in hunting pollinators. And we do have other spiders you might see crawling around on the ground near the garden. Spiders are good to have around. Okay, uh, so we're going to go back uh, to a little bit more of a broader approach uh, as we wrap up thinking about ways to incorporate uh, these insects, these beneficials into our gardens and uh, cultural practices that we can adopt so that we are making decisions that benefit them. So integrated pest management is something that uh, professionals use who work with plants um, because pest outbreaks are inevitable. Um, again, especially if you're working with uh, a lot of one species in a concentrated area. So uh, thinking like a farmer or a greenhouse operator or a nursery uh, worker, uh, you want to nip this in the bud. When you see a problem with a pest, um, decide first you want to identify it and decide if it's something you can live with or if something's going to become a bigger and bigger problem the longer it goes on. And from there, you want to see if there's any practices that you can make uh, that change your behavior so that the pest might go away on its own or become less of a problem. Uh, if you do need to intervene, um, trapping, physical removal, there's a variety of things you can do um, with pesticide being the tool of last resort. Um, so it is a tool, uh, but it is a tool that needs to be used very carefully and very sparingly. Um, if pesticides are used inappropriately, it can um, have a lot of unintended consequences that are negative for the environment and for human health. Uh, and one of the biggest risks in my mind is uh, the resistance of some of these pests to the chemicals if they're used inappropriately. Um, and, then, and then what do you do if your chemical doesn't even work and you have an outbreak? So things to consider. Okay, so how can you make your habitat healthier for them? Well, add the basics, food, water, and shelter. Um, all organisms need this. So if you think about the food, water, and shelter needs of an insect, uh, this can be accommodated in a very small space and provide a lot of value. Uh, so flowering plants, um, some of our butterflies like sap and rotting fruit, uh, some of our insects like to live in and eat rotting wood, provide a water source for them, uh, leave your dead plant material in the garden as much as possible. Uh, that's habitat, that's shelter for them, um, and enjoy your space. Um, to me, this is the greatest part of beneficial insects is just watching them do their thing out in your gardens. 
and sharing this with children, in my experience, um, a lot of the children I've met just absolutely love finding bugs, catching bugs. Um, so this is a really great way to make some awesome observations and learn with the little ones and have some fun together. All right, gardening on the wild side. So we're just about wrapping up, but I just had a couple more recommendations uh, for how you can invite these guys into your gardens and some of the benefits that you'll get. Um, so I mentioned leaving dead plants near their source. So we leave um, dead limbs on our trees in our home garden. If it's not gonna fall and break um, something that we can't live without, uh, it's great habitat for a lot of our insects. Um, beetles like to live in bunch grasses. Those are also places where um, insects will overwinter. That's a good shelter for them. And some of our butterflies need grasses as host plants. Um, bare ground is okay. We met our solitary bees that tunnel directly in uh, to that soil. So if you've got really thick mulch in your gardens, uh, those solitary bees are never going to be able to tunnel through that much mulch to get to the actual soil. So use mulch sparingly. Uh, this garden uses it around the edges in that photograph uh, and then just has a riot of plants in the middle. Uh, I also like how they used a um, natural wood fence as an accent. Um, so we've just got a bunch of sticks lined up. So again, that's just a great way to use natural materials to encourage uh, and provide great habitat for those beneficial insects. Uh, and also, uh, if you grow it, they will come. Uh, you don't need to buy praying mantises. You don't need to pay for ladybugs. Just provide that flowering plant habitat from spring through fall, and the beneficial insects will come on their own. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you can see um, some of the top produce foods that benefit from having insects in the garden um, and some of the other plants, um, mostly native plants and other flowering plants that you can add to the garden to support them. Okay, and I can't leave without mentioning this because this is uh, something that I still hear people say um, that goldenrod gives them allergies. So I did a search for ragweed on the internet and you get uh, disturbingly mixed results. Um, so some of these photographs and these top hits are actual ragweed photographs. Um, those first three on the top left are ragweed, uh, but then those other two to the right of that are goldenrod, and you can see some other goldenrod pictures mixed in there. The beautiful bright yellow flowers are not ragweed, and they do not give fall allergies. Um, so that's a common misconception because people see goldenrod flowers at the same time they get their fall allergies. Um, but goldenrod pollen is large, it's heavy, it's designed to stay put in the flowers till the pollinators come to it. Uh, ragweed pollen, on the other hand, is very small and designed to blow on the wind. It does not use pollinators. The wind is its pollinator. Uh, so that's why there is this common misconception. We see goldenrod while we experience our ragweed allergies. So educate your friends and family um, that goldenrod is not their problem. It is a joyful plant to have in the garden. Uh, and here's a close up of some of those monarchs um, and another butterfly uh, and a little bumblebee in the middle enjoying some goldenrod. Uh, it is a jungle of life when it's blooming and benefits a wide variety of insects. So I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, here's a few of my favorite resources. I've added some live links in here, so hopefully those will translate and you can click right through uh, if you wanna know where to grow plants and especially those natives. Uh, we do have some great local options. Visit our Maryland Native Plant Society website to learn more about that. Uh, if you have questions, University of Maryland Extension, um, Sam Drogi, Mike Rops Bug of the Weep, those are great resources to learn more. Uh, also, Xerxes Society is a national organization, maybe even international. They have great resources on their website as well. Uh, and then below, we have a couple of sites where you can directly participate in citizen science and collect records um, that you can put online, share with others, and learn from others. Uh, also, one of my favorite books that helped inspire me to plant for pollinators and for wildlife, um, Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home. It's a great read. I highly recommend it.
Okay, so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave those in the comment section and we will get to those and answer them as soon as we're able. Thank you so much for tuning in and get outside and enjoy those beneficial insects.